Hello, everybody. Um, Adam Pendleton is our speaker this evening. Um, Adam is a multidisciplinary practice. His practice addresses issues about language, history, race, and politics in American culture. Um, Adam was educated at the Artspace Independent Studio Program in Pietra San, um, Italy, and through residencies at the Museum of Modern Art, the Studio Museum in Harlem, and the Isabel Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston. He shows in New York at Pace Gallery and is working in the permanent collections of the Museum of Modern Art, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago, the Carnegie Mellon um, um, Art Institute in Pittsburgh, and the Studio Museum of Harlem. Adam Pendleton. Hi. Can we turn off the, the lights, please? So let's start. Germantown is a small rural town in upstate New York, about 100 miles from New York City. Its western edge abuts the Hudson River. The town has a population of about 2,000. On Main Street, there are six businesses, a United States post office, a grocery store, an old-fashioned variety store, a liquor store, GTEL, Germantown's telephone, cable, and internet provider, and a bed and breakfast. I moved to Germantown in 2007 and lived across the street from the local grocery store, Otto's Market. 212 Main Street, where I lived, was a large building that looked like an overgrown house from the outside, nothing special. I was told by the residents of Germantown that the space I occupied was at various points used as a factory, dance hall, and even a basketball court. All believable. While the building didn't look like much from the outside, the inside was grand. It was a large open space with nearly 20-foot ceilings. The back of the space had a large loft space where I slept. I moved to Germantown after being in New York City for six years. I wanted to live in a quieter place, and a friend, the art dealer Alexander Gray, mentioned Germantown in a fantastic space. His friend was about to give up. I drove up from the city, looked at the space, and decided to move there. There isn't much to do in Germantown but work. There is no nightlife, no restaurants, no bars, no clubs. I would do some of my most important work in Germantown, laying the foundations for projects that continue to this day. I'd like to think about the work in relationship to three theoretical and at times physical sites. Inside, outside, in the space of the work as a third condition. Inside. In the summer of 2012, I invited the photographer Paul Mpaji Sapuya to document my studio in Germantown as I prepared for an exhibition that would be staged in the fall of 2012 in London. In his own work, Sapuya utilizes his studio as both a site of production for his photographic work and also as a material element that folds itself into his work. This is Paul's work. I asked Paul to essentially create a portrait of my work environment, to document the photocopies and stacks of books that gather on my work table. The way in which 
the photocopies and books are arranged and rearranged as bodies of work progress. How images, books, and text are added to the table and subtracted, a perpetually evolving collage. The works I hang and lean against the studio's walls. My library. I was curious what story would be told or revealed through this process. Having always been aware that the ways in which I arranged things in my studio was an untold story about my work, I wanted to photograph the characters to see what they would have to say. As Brian O'Doherty says in his follow-up to Inside the White Cube, Studio and Cube, spaces obtain their meaning from excuse me, spaces obtain their meaning from social arrangements confirmed by usage, which can change. Implicit in each studio is an ideology derived from that agreement. So we can read studios as text that are as revelatory in their way as artworks themselves. My studio, though, is not the site where the final object is executed. It is a space to test concepts, materials, and scale. A place for research, reading, and reflection. It is proof that I am a conceptual artist, one could say. Falling somewhere between, say, Lewitt Charles Gaines and Adrian Piper. One of the reoccurring images that Paul captured in his photographs were photocopies of reproductions of Lewitt's incomplete open cubes from 1974. I used these photocopies to create my Black Dada paintings, which incorporate cropped enlargements of the photocopies with letters from the words black in Dada. The paintings have their own rules of composition, a system that dictates visual and or formal decisions, and by virtue of its limits reveals something about the object's meaning and in many ways the potential of this idea of black and Dada, black Dada. Rosalind Krauss wrote in her essay on the work of Lewitt, The Lewitt Matrix, quote, system is equated with subject, with the subject, with subjectivity, with self. What Paul's photographs reveal is the overarching visual system or method I utilize in the studio. It is at turns systematic and illogical, given to chance and modes of repetition. Outside. 
One of the first works I finished in the Germantown studio was a performance, The Revival. The Revival was staged in 2007 in New York at Stephen Weiss Studio, a minimal, large open space in the West Village. For the performance, I turned the space into a, ki into a kind of minimalist church with simple wood benches and a set that consisted of one central platform that was flanked by two lower platforms on the left and right side. Behind the platforms were two large multi-tiered platforms where members of a gospel choir stood and performed during the performance. Between the gospel choir was a band featuring the pianist Jason Moran, a drummer, and a bass player. The revival in evening length work employed the format of a religious revival to investigate experimental uses of language by way of a secular sermon. The language in the revival comes from numerous sources, ranging from Jesse Jackson's 1984 speech at the Democratic National Convention to Larry Kramer's 2004 speech, The Tragedy of Today's Gays. At one point, I state that the experience of language is not isolated. It is an act taking place in the world like all else. It is not the act separate describing the world. It is, it occurs in real time. Sunsets, forests, Just pause. 
better than other people. I really do. I feel we're smarter and more talented and more aware. And I do, I do, I totally do. And I think we're more tuned in to what's happening, tuned in to the moment, tuned in to our emotions and other people's emotions, and we're better friends. I really do think all of these things. After the revival, when I returned to the space of the studio, I took a bit of a sabbatical from making work. Performance, performing radically altered my relationship to the object. And I began to ask myself, how do I represent the conditions and potential of performance in or through an art object? The following year, I began work on two bodies of work that would create a site of engagement where the viewer is asked to actively participate in the reading of the work through language, system, and material. They included the Black Dada paintings and also the System of Display series, which use mirrors to inscribe the viewer into the space of the work and like the paintings, fragmented representations of language. I have made one work of art literally outside. In September 2011, with the support of SF MoMA, I traveled to Oakland, California to shoot a video portrait of David Hilliard. Hilliard was the chief of staff of the Black Panther Party. The portrait was the second in a series of video portraits I've been working on. The portraits, inspired in part by Gertrude Stein's textual portraits, attempt to capture not the fact of representation, but the elusive idea of it. What am I? What are we peering into? Hilliard gives, or gave, I'm not sure if he's doing them anymore, tours in Oakland, California, of historical sites related to the Black Panther Party, the church where the Panthers hosted their free breakfast program, the first Panther office, health clinics where Huey Newton was shot and killed. The portrait was filmed while riding around in a car with David and on the streets and sidewalks of Oakland when we'd get out of the car for a closer view. The camera often treats Hilliard as a formal subject, zooming in close, revealing the details of his face and hands. When the piece was edited, I paid particular attention to David's voice and the language that he used. How time had shaped his memories and the way in which he articulated his experiences many years later. The subject matter resonated and resonates deeply, particularly now in a moment where there's a heightened awareness of police brutality across our country. Towards the end of the film, David recounts a shootout with the police a day after the assassination of Martin Luther King that left a young member of the Panther Party, Bobby Hutton, dead. The Panthers' education was outside, outside of the walls of a college or university, a group of friends young men who were responding to a complicated situation. As David remarks in the video, the Panther, the Black Panther Party was all of that to me. 
it's my, it's my education. Here's a single clip, a single channel version clip of the video installation. So you're gonna make a right at the at the light, and and it's, make a right at the light. We're gonna stop for a minute so I can talk about this location. Uh, there's some 19 of these sites that uh, we do in the uh, Black Panther History Tours. Okay, we're at site number one. This is the, where Bobby Seal and Huey Newton worked in this building right here. So stop right here, and that sort of leads us up to where we're going next, where um, there's bloodshed and bloody footprints along the way. And this happened at the location where I'm taking you now. But this is the place where the breakfast programs um, were engendered. So that's where we're heading now. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a right at the corner. And another right. And then a left when you can. This is the first Black Panther Party office. Not much has changed in this particular area. Uh, in the old days, that store on the corner, we used to hang out there. Go to the light and make a left. It all looks the same. So we're gonna get out here and walk right down the street. So do you want to do what Huey got shot? Got to go there, I think, where he was killed. So it's that next street that goes through. You'll go down that one. Not at the next one, down the next corner. So you want to get out, I'll show you where Huey got killed. This, this used to be graffiti right here. It used to be Huey. That, that's the gun, that's his beret. He's holding a shotgun. Hello? Hello? Where'd he go? You can show them because I'm not exactly yeah. sure where they are. So there's uh, one here. Working with the Panthers sort of struck a nerve. It sort of, sort of, you know, shaped me up. All of a sudden, it's like this is what I'm supposed to be doing. That for me, that was the. Um, total summation of all of the, the stuff that I've been looking and witnessing. Foremost was the Watts riots. Then I read this Life magazine with the riots in Newark. And the little boy on the front of the magazine was back blown open was just so forceful to me. And then when Huey came by and started talking about Malcolm, and he says, that guy is like you. And he's like us. You, you, could, you could be like him. And I said, but I just saw him and I got to get his book, and I got to read it. He's a funny guy with some horn rim glasses and look real weird, you know, with a bow tie. And it's like, nobody, who is this weird dude? It's Malcolm. But we don't know Muslim, some, some extraterrestrial. We were saying, when he said Muslim, we were saying, we hear mullah. So I know that's maybe a word. But we're saying, oh, he's one of those Mullah guys. He comes out, I slung a Lincoln. To us, that it sounds like he said, I slung Lincoln. So we're these jokesters, so we say, oh, shit, we slung George Washington. And ah, ha, 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 ha. And so, but then Huey says, he's not saying that. He's saying, I slung a Lincoln. You should go hear him. He's going to be at the mosque. And he's talking these words, and he's the most articulate, the most powerful example of people like me that I've ever seen. And I said, I could be that guy. I want to be him. To be a part of this movement that, you know, sort of touched my spirit, I, you know, not 
watching the women and the kids being beaten and, and, and people singing hymns and stuff like that, not that at all, and rejected it with every fiber in my body. But remember that I came from the South with a strong family who always said that you got to always stand up and you can't take abuse and that. I mean, I came from that. It's part of my, my upbringing. And I meet Huey, who was my childhood friend, was always this weird guy, always reading books, always we dying to dance and screw girls. He's reciting poetry. I started reading, he gave me these books like The Wretched of the Earth, which was harder than reading the Bible. And I don't know anything about this. He said, I'll teach you. Everything that you don't know, you come to me and I'll teach you. And how do you define politics? What does that mean? He says, well, it starts with a hungry stomach. <laughs> I understand that. The Black Panther Party was all of that for me, you know. It, you know, it's my, it's my education. Yeah. This is the video installation installed in New York in 2014. The space of the work. I've mentioned more than once the Black Dada paintings, but what is Black Dada? What does it do? What does it look like? Black Dada was a phrase that I began using in 2008. It began as a way to think about black as an open-ended open -ended signifier in relationship to Dada a radical moment in 20th century art, born out of artists responding to the reality of the First World War. How do artists, should artists, respond to their contemporary dynamic? The only definition I have offered to date of Black Dada is that it's a way to talk about the future, sociopolitical, while talking about the past art historical. It is our present moment. In 2011, I edited a reader with Jenny Schlinska, an associate curator at MoMA PS1, to delve deeper into this idea. The reader is organized into four sections, foundations, language, artist positions, and manifesto. The foundation section includes texts that are foundational to the concept, with pieces ranging from Hugo Ball's 1916 Dada Manifesto to W.E.B. Du Bois's seminal essay on our spiritual strivings. The language section focuses on experimental uses of language and amongst other pieces includes an example of Gertrude Stein's writing in a piece by the contemporary poet Harriet Mullen. The artist position section provided an opportunity to feature other artists whose work, in my mind, expresses something about black data. The artists range from Joan Jonas and Adrian Piper to Thomas Hirschhorn and Ad Reinhardt. The section includes interviews, essays written by or about the artists, and even a Stan Douglas screenplay. The last section, Manifesto, is a reproduction of a performative text I wrote in 2008, which is called Black Dada. The reader ended up being 300 pages, and it's basically spiral-bound photocopies. In many ways, my studio table and book format collaged, reworked. And here are some images of the reader.
For the 56th Venice Biennial, I was invited by the curator Katarina Gregos and the Belgian artist Vincent Meissen to participate in the Belgian Pavilion. I ended up creating an installation that brought together all the various threads of my work, from the reader to my process in the studio. Images that had become a part of my perpetually expanding archive were turned into wall works, which are large-scale enlargements of photocopied and often collaged images. The wall works became backdrops for my Black Data system of display and underpondance works. The installation also includes posters based on pages from the Black Dotter Reader, ultimately the space of the work. Thank you. Hey guys. Okay, so we're gonna move into the question section of this. Thank you, Adam. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Um, so if you guys have a question. Thank you for being here tonight. And Phenomenal work. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, I'm from upstate New York as well, um, and the thought of ever having to move back there just makes me sick. But So I'm just like curious, like um, when you were moving out of the city to upstate New York, did you feel at any point, like, because, you know, New York City is considered to be like the heart of it all and, you know, where the whole art scene is, and you said you moved to this place that's very small. Did you feel at any point it was a mistake or that you were going backwards or that you were isolating <laughs> yourself? Or yes, it was a mistake and I definitely went backwards. Um, no, I'm kidding. Uh, no, I didn't feel like that. No, because it was, very, it was a very uh, conscious and considered decision and it was at a moment where I felt as though I wasn't going to be able to make any kind of um, real progress with my work if I had stayed in the city uh, because the, the city has become a very distracted space for me at that moment. And so leaving, you know, going 90 minutes, 90 miles north made a, a good deal of sense. Um, and I, I still felt very much so connected and in a strange way more involved with what was going on in the city because I had the time and space to concentrate. Hi, um, I noticed that with the exception of your performance piece, your work seems to be exclusively in black and white. I don't know if that's coincidental or if there was a deeper meaning behind that. Could you elaborate on that? Uh, well, the, the work became more black and white, uh, but there's also at times I introduce grays as well. Uh, but also a lot of the surfaces are mirrored, so a mirrored surface kind of reflects what's ever around it. So it, it, in my mind, it's not exclusively black or white, shades of black, etc., different kinds of surfaces. Um, but a part of that was very much so because I felt when I was using color in my work, it was very distracting for people who were experiencing and looking at the work to actual, actually have um, a considered interaction with the work that wasn't sort of overwhelmed with the concerns of color, quite frankly. The formal concerns of color. In your video piece, 
Um, I noticed that, is this on? Yes. Oh, okay. Oh, <laughs> this video piece, I noticed that with both of the videos, there was always one in motion, and you didn't necessarily, speci like, specifically, when you pointed out spots, it would just pause in the film, yeah. and it wouldn't go into deeper, in a deep depth about what that was about. Um, is there any reason why you did that? Well, I'm very interested in abstraction, and particularly realism in relationship to abstraction and mechanisms and modes of representation. So you kind of had the fact of David as an individual, as a human being, and juxtaposed with that you know, sort of fact, you had these other facts, the side of a building, a street sign, uh, a, you know, a, ca a parked car. Uh, so it was kind of a way to, to layer what these things could mean, do mean, in relationship to each other, how David inhabited a, his spa a, a space, which was Oakland, California. Um, so it was a way of, of, of playing with modes and mechanisms of representation, ultimately. Uh, let's get one more question. Ah. Could you elaborate on, um, you mentioned with the, like the first paintings you showed us after the photos, that there was like a specific set of limitations you had given yourself for mm. creating the, like the compositions. Could you like go more into, into how that works? Yes, I will, I will try to. Yeah, it, so essentially it, it, it's basically rules about how the image can be composed or utilized within an eight foot by almost six and a half foot space. The language has to float on the edge of the frame. It has to read from right to left, et cetera, et cetera. It's impossible to, for me to say how it works, but if you look at the paintings over time, you'll see that there are certain consistent elements that, compositional elements that don't change. They, some things have changed over time, but I find as an artist, when I impose limits on myself, it, it opens up both my formal vocabulary uh, but also, it, it encourages me to push the work in a very directed way. Uh, thank you. Thank you. City. Its western edge abuts the Hudson River. The town has a population of about 2,000. On Main Street, there are six businesses, a United States post office, a grocery store, an old-fashioned variety store, a liquor store, GTEL, Germantown's telephone, cable, and internet provider, and a bed and breakfast. I moved to Germantown in 2007 and lived across the street from the local grocery store, Otto's Market. 212 Main Street, where I lived, was a large building that looked like an overgrown house from the outside, nothing special. I was told by the residents of Germantown that the space I occupied was at various points used as a factory, dance hall, and even a basketball court all believable. While the building didn't look like much from the outside, the inside was grand as bodies of work progress. How images, books, and text are added to the table and subtracted, a perpetually evolving collage the works I hang and lean against the studio's walls.
my library. I was curious what story would be told or revealed through this process. Having always been aware that the ways in which I arranged things in my studio was an untold story about my work, I wanted to photograph the characters to see what they would have to say. As Brian O'Doherty says in his follow-up to Inside the White Cube, Studio and Cube, spaces obtain their meaning from Excuse me, spaces obtain their meaning from It was a large open space with nearly 20 foot ceilings. The back of the space had a large loft space where I slept. I moved to Germantown after being in New York City for six years. I wanted to live in a quieter Place, and a friend, the art dealer Alexander Gray, mentioned Germantown in a fantastic space. His friend was about to give up. I drove up from the city, looked at the space, and decided to move there. There isn't much to do in Germantown but work. There is no nightlife. No restaurants, no bars, no clubs. I would do some of my most important work in Germantown, laying the foundations for projects that continue to this day. I'd like to think about the work in relationship to three theoretical and at times Hello, everybody. Um, Adam Pendleton is our speaker this evening. Um, Adam is a multidisciplinary practice. His practice addresses issues about language, history, race, and politics in American culture. Um, Adam was educated at the Art Space Independent Studio Program in Pietra San, um, Italy, and through residencies at the Museum of Modern Art, the Studio Museum in Harlem, and the Isabel Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston. He shows in New York at Pace Gallery, and his work is in the permanent collections of the Museum of Modern Art, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago, the Carnegie Mellon um, um, Art Institute in Pittsburgh, and the Studio Museum of Harlem. Adam Pendleton. Hi. Can we turn off the, the lights, please? So let's start. Germantown is a small rural town in upstate New York, about 100 miles from New York Times physical sites. Inside, outside, in the space of the work as a third condition. Inside. In the summer of 2012, I invited the photographer Paul Mpaji Sapuya to document my studio in Germantown as I prepared for an exhibition that would be staged in the fall of 2012 in London. In his own work, Sapuya utilizes his studio as both a site of production for his photographic work and also as a material element that folds itself into his work. This is Paul's work. I asked Paul to essentially create a portrait of my work environment, to document the photocopies and stacks of books that gather on my work table, the way in which the photocopies and books are arranged and rearranged 